All right. Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Galatians. We're going to read chapter 1 and verses 1 through 10 as we consider this magnificent epistle together. So beginning in verse 1, it begins this way, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. But do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ." And God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. I want to begin just by introducing this epistle a little bit. Um, it's been called various things. Uh, some uh, from the other side of the pond in England have called it the Magna Carta of Christian freedom. Uh, the Magna Carta was a document that the king reluctantly signed because it gave more power to his subjects. Uh, usually he was a, almost like a dictator, and, and so this signing of the Magna Carta gave more power to his subjects and kind of brought in a sense of liberty and freedom. Uh, those on this side of the pond would call it the Declaration of Independence of Christian Liberty. And so certainly it is a, a great freedom letter. I love what Martin Luther called it. He called it My Catherine von Bora, Katharina von Bora. That was the name of his wife. And what he said was, because I'm married to it. <laughs> Just as he was married to Katharina von Bora, he said, I'm married to the epistle of the Galatians. And I've met people like this who have come out of a very legalistic background and they just love Galatians. They live in Galatians. It's to them, it's it's freedom. It's a it's a, a book of great freedom and a great great liberty. Many believe that Galatians was written in the late 40s, uh, perhaps uh, AD 49 would be a good uh, date to put connected with this letter. And the reason why is uh, the the subject matter, of course, being uh, do do those that believe Christ have to be circumcised? Do they have to keep the law of Moses? That was all debated very publicly uh, at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter fifteen. That that council a letter was produced that was to be circulated, basically giving the dis decision of the council, which included the apostles and the brethren and all that kind of thing. Well, if Paul is dealing with exactly the same issue in Galatians, and surely if this had have taken place after Acts 15, this letter had been written after Acts 15, he would have simply just referred to the decision that was made in Jerusalem. He never mentions it in his letter. So it would tell us that most likely this was written before the decision of the Jerusalem council. Because yeah, surely if you're going to defend the liberty of the gospel, you would include that if it was available, but he doesn't include it. And so what we'd say is this, we, we know fairly certainly that that Jerusalem council took place in AD 50. So this epistle had to be written before. So we're, we're, we're going to say, and uh, we're in good company. A lot of people have come to this conclusion that Galatians was AD 49 and then that council, because this subject, even though Paul wrote this masterful epistle, the problem didn't go away. The Judaizers did not disappear. They continued to dog the steps of the Apostle Paul 
And Paul finally said, okay, we've got to go to the Jerusalem and sort this out. And he and Barnabas went up. The thing was sorted out. The letter was written. So this was written prior to that, which occurred in AD 50. And so uh, very uh, significant that um, many believe Paul was converted around AD 35. So he had actually been a believer about 14 years when he wrote this epistle. <laughs> and it's incredible to think of a person just 14 years in Christ, uh, and yet with such clarity of understanding. And of course, we're going to see a little bit in this chapter why he was so clear in un his, his understanding of these things. And it's because of divine revelation. He was shown these things by the Lord. And so, uh, again, a very, very marvelous letter that we're, I'm sure, going to enjoy immensely. And the main topic, of course, is justification by faith, without the deeds of the law. That's the main topic of Galatians. How a person can be justified, declared righteous by faith without the deeds of the law. And again, this is so important because uh, we're going to see as we look at this letter that Judaizers still haven't gone away. There are still plenty of them in our culture who would want to put you back under the Mosaic law, either for salvation or all for sanctification. So this is a very, very important letter. He's defending in this letter the purity of the gospel because there were those who were already perverting the gospel. And there's a need to defend the purity of the gospel. Even to this very day, there are people constantly wanting to add to the gospel, add something, uh, something that man can do. Uh, you see, the gospel just devastates the ego of man by telling man there's nothing you can do. You have to trust in what somebody else has done for you. And man wants to do something to contribute to his salvation. Oh, but if I could just go on a pilgrimage, if I could just count beads, if I could just do something. And this message is, no, it's a finished work. It's already been done. You have to depend on the one who did that work and depend on him alone. And of course, it's uh, it's it's hard on the pride of man. I want to do something. Let me do something to contribute. Just as God raised Moses to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, I believe that God raised Paul up specifically to deliver the Christian church from Jewish bondage. And what I mean by that is that if this letter had not been written, if Paul had not so vehemently defended what we would call the gospel of the grace of God, Christianity would have just become a subsect of Judaism rather than something completely independent of it. And so very, very important for us to understand not only this epistle, but also Acts 15 uh, would be good, even though it came afterwards, it would be good uh, to have a good understanding of Acts chapter 15 as well, to grasp these important truths. Because as we say, the continual tendency to the Judaizing of Christianity continues to this very hour. So you have sects like the Seventh-day Adventists who say we should be keeping the Sabbath and we should be keeping the dietary laws. You have a lot of Christians who would tell us we need to keep the dietary laws. I was recently called a false teacher for saying that we can eat bacon and uh, enjoy it <laughs> because the net, uh, I'm pretty sure there was a pig in that net uh, that came down. And so again, uh, there are even believers that are caught up with this legal thing. Uh, and uh, uh, there's the Hebrew messianic movement that, uh, again, wants to go back and play in the shadows rather than enjoy the substance that there is in Christ. And so there are people that want to go back to this kind of stuff. And of course, even probably one of the most deadly things of all, what we call replacement theology, that basically says the church has replaced Israel in the purposes of God. And of course, along with that comes anti-Semiticism, great hatred of, of Israel. Uh, amazing. Uh, that, that movement of replacement theology robs the believer of his hope in the rapture and robs Israel of its future blessings. It's one of the biggest thieves on the block. <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible thing, replacement theology. And yet it's so popular and growing all the time. And so, again, we need to see Galatians is a tremendously important letter 
Uh, and so Galatians, we might say this, deals with the teaching of justification controversially <laughs> because it's a controversy. There's a, there's a controversy. Uh, people are wanting to add law to grace. They're wanting to say yeah, justification uh, by faith plus something else. And so it, he's dealing with it as a matter of controversy. He's defending the purity of the gospel. Whereas Romans deals with the teaching of justification systematically, just kind of unfolding it systematically. Again, very good companion epistle to Galatians. Romans emphasizes the Christian standing. Uh, we stand by faith in God's grace. Wonderful, wonderful epistle. Galatians is insisting that the Christian stands, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. One is talking about our standing, the other is telling us stand, stand fast in this liberty. Don't allow anybody to rob you of the liberty that we have in Christ. Now, as we as we're going to divide up this book, it's it's a very easy book to divide uh, because it, it's six chapters and it nicely divides into three sets of two. And so that's how we're going to approach it. So we're going to look at chapters one and two, and we're going to see that chapters one and two is both personal and historical. Uh, personal because Paul is telling us how he got his gospel, how he got his apostleship. You know, so it's very personal, but it's also very historical. He goes through the history of how the gospel came, how how, and so we might say is chapters one and two deal with this issue: where is this gospel from? Where did it come from? Right, historically, very very important. And and I'm going to give you a kind of a key verse that goes along with each of these sections. And so uh, chapter 2 and verse 4 would go along with this first section, the historical section, where the gospel is from. And, uh, of course, uh, each of these key verses are all to do with liberty. Okay, so I want you just to see the, the kind of uh, thing that joins them together is liberty. So it says in verse uh, 4 of chapter 2, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Of course, that's the whole setting, isn't it? That these false teachers have come in, snuck in, uh, they've spied out their liberty, and they want to rob you of it. They want to steal it from you. So very, very important about liberty in that first section. So chapters 1 and 2, historical, where is the gospel from? Uh, and of course, the answer is revelation. It was it was given as a divine revelation. It didn't come from man. He didn't receive it from man, but he got it from the risen, glorious head, the Lord Jesus Himself. And so, the, uh, revelation being the key topic of chapters one and two. When we look at chapters three and four, we're now moving into the doctrinal section. And instead of revelation being the theme, the theme is justification. He's going to talk a lot about justification. And instead of where is the gospel from, we're going to be looking at what the gospel is. He's going to tell us very clearly what the gospel is. Now, again, our key verse on liberty actually skips over into chapter 5, verse 1, uh, because sometimes where the line is drawn in these letters <laughs> is uh, by those that give us the chapter and verse divisions is not exactly perfect. And so in chapter five, verse one, it says this, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled, entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And so again, uh, don't let anybody steal the, the liberty away from you. Don't let them bring you into bondage. Again, it's kind of reset it in chapter 2, verse 4. He's saying the same thing again, chapter 5. Don't let anybody rob you of your liberty in Christ. Chapters 5 and 6, the final section is practical, and it's dealing with sanctification. So just again to remind us, first section, revelation, how the gospel came by divine revelation. Second se section is doctrinal justification third section practical sanctification and so if in the first section we were asking the question where's the gospel come from <laughs> comes via divine revelation uh second section um, what the gospel is 
that a man is declared righteous without the deeds of the law through faith in Christ, right? What the gospel is. And then the third section is, what does the gospel do? And that's a great section, isn't it? See, what the gospel does is something the law could not do. The gospel changes lives. It makes sinners into saints. <laughs> it makes them holy. <laughs> it transforms them. And so this whole subject of sanctification is dealt with in chapters 5 and 6. And so as we um, will enjoy that section, I'm sure, immensely. But look at chapter 5, verse 13. He says, again, this idea of liberty. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty only. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And when we get to that sanctification section, it's a lovely section, what we're going to say is this, and I think it's really worth saying and it's important to say, a lot of people confuse liberty with license. And he's telling us, do not dare to use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. In other words, don't turn liberty into license. See, one of the accusations of the Judaizers is, well, you see, if you if you throw out Moses' law, uh, people are going to do whatever they want, and uh, they're not going to be obedient. And, of course, he's going to tell us that actually it's not law that causes obedience, it's love. And he's going to, again, that verse we've just read, beautiful verse, and, and he, he says at the end of it, uh, let's read it all again, for brethren, you have been called into liberty, on, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And of course, didn't the Lord Jesus sum up the law in one way? He said this, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that love is given to us by the Spirit of God, which enables us to do what the law couldn't do. The law could tell us what was right and wrong, but it couldn't help us to do it. But the gospel does help us to do it, <laughs> to live a life that's pleasing to God, to live a, a holy life. And so the law is, in a sense, very limited. Um, the law cannot justify a man in itself. Again, just look at some scriptures, Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, this is chapter 2, verse 16, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. A man can never be made righteous by keeping the law. A man is declared to be righteous through faith in the work of the Lord Jesus. Very, very key, key verse. Uh, in fact, I would suggest to you it's the key verse of the entire epistle. It really kind of summarizes everything we want to say. Maybe we should read it again just because it's so important. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I mean, nothing could be clearer than that in terms of a dogmatic statement that law can never justify a man. Only faith in the finished work of Christ can justify a man. So it can't justify a man. The law can't bring righteousness. Uh, notice again, chapter 2, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And of course, the whole point is that Christ had to die because, because righteousness can't come by the law. <laughs> it's impossible to live it. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't do it. Uh, Galatians 3, 17. The law can't annul the promise that was made to Abraham. Galatians 3.17, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. So the law can't disannul the promise that was made to Abraham. 
and that was that all nations would be blessed through him. And uh, again, he was declared righteous by faith, same way that we're declared righteous by faith in the Messiah that would come through his line that would bring blessing to all the nations. And so the law is so limited in what it can do. Now, just a, a couple more things to mention before we actually dive into chapter one. Um, first of all, this epistle is full of words that are set in contrast against each other. So I'm going to point the words out. We'll see them as we go through, but I'm just going to point them out for now. So you've got law, which is always going to be contrasted with grace. Law and grace. You have got a gospel, and then you have another gospel, <laughs> which is not another. So you've got the true gospel, and then you have this other gospel, which is a false gospel. So gospel, another gospel. You have works contrasted with faith. People are not saved by work, but they're saved by faith. You have law contrasted with promise. You have servant contrasted with son. We're not a bond servant, we're sons. You have bond, bondage contrasted with liberty. And you're going to finally end up with flesh contrasted with spirit. So we're going to notice as we go through, I'm just kind of throwing them out there, but there's going to be a lot of words that Paul's going to use, and he's going to set them in contrast against each other. A question a lot of people have asked is, why did the Lord allow so many problems to develop so quickly in the early church? It seems that almost all the books that were written <laughs> have some issue going on. And so in Corinthians, there's lots of issues, right? There's immorality, there's a party spirit, there's the abuse of gifts, there's some teaching, the resurrection is past. There's, there's just so much going on, so many problems. We think we have problems. But these early churches were full of problems. Philippians, probably one of the best assemblies in terms of health, and yet you have two sisters that won't speak to each other. They can't get on. And the problem with these two sisters that don't get on is that they've got people who love these two sisters, and if we don't get this thing sorted out, we could end up with a, a division in this lovely assembly. And so you've got interpersonal conflict going on in the assembly of sisters who are well-known, well-respected, but they've fallen out. And so the problem, Colossians, you have the origin of the Gnostic heresy in its embryo form coming in, false views of the person of Christ coming in. Galatians, again, we, we, we're going to see here false doctrine. They're putting us under the law. Thessalonica, uh, persecution, uh, people so caught up with the second coming of Christ that they're quitting work and, uh, and then becoming busybodies rather than serving the Lord like they ought to. Lots of problems. The New Testament is full of problems. So why, Lord, why did you, why didn't you let the early church kind of get his kind of uh, feet under the table, so to speak, before all these problems occurred? How come they couldn't, as it were, sink down some deep roots? How come all these problems occurred so early on? And the the answer is twofold, and and it's really important that we understand this. First of all, it was necessary for this to happen so early on so that the apostles were still of, alive to deal with them. Men of sufficient and accepted stature would be around to deal with the matters. Th there was definite apostolic authority. That's how Paul's going to start this letter. How, how, what right does he have to tell the Galatian churches? Well, it's because he's an apostle of the risen Christ. And he has the authority of the of that apostleship behind him. So, so, so the the reason why these were allowed is so you have apostolic authority still around on earth to deal with it, and so that's why it all happened so quickly. Secondly, because it provides case law for current day Christians, we have similar problems. The heart of man has never changed we talked about we still have people who would like to bring us into bondage uh we still have people who abuse liberty and turn it into license we all of these things we have we were facing them today but now at least we have case law how did the apostles deal with these problems oh that's how we can deal with it what do we do when we have immorality in the assembly well we've got 
First Corinthians 5, it's right there to help us. What do we do with people abusing the Lord's Supper? we got chapter 11. we got all of these things that are case law that we can go to. And even though we ourselves don't have apostolic authority, we can refer to apostolic authority in dealing with these things. And so this is why these early churches were so full of problems. Just one final comment before we jump in, and that is this. Some of the strongest language used in the New Testament is used in this epistle because of the serious nature of attacking the gospel of the grace of God. And so Paul's going to say some very strong things. He's going to talk about these false teachers. Let them be accursed. Let them be castrated. <laughs> uh, he's he's going to talk about them being bewitched. Who's bewitched you? Who's put them? Who's put you under the spell? I mean, this is pretty strong language. So uh, again, we're going to see that. And, and we see that I, I've been going through the uh, the epistles of John with a, a group of young men on Zoom. And one of the things we often think of John as the apostle of love, but boy, he uses some strong language too. When people begin to attack either the gospel of Christ or the person of Christ, John talks about antichrists, about false prophets. <laughs> I mean, he's, his language is equally strong. Uh, somehow, the apostle of love is turning once again into a son of thunder, but it's spirit-directed because the person he loves so much is being attacked. And so, again, we, we need to learn from this, that there is a time to stand. There is a time to call it what it is and confront wrongdoing and wrong doctrine. Uh, do it, yes, do it in love, but do it and speak the truth. And that's what we find in these letters. So now as we look at this um, opening section, the historical section, amongst other things, the historical section emphasizes that Paul's authority was directly imparted to him by Christ himself and that he his divinely given authority was fully recognized by his fellow apostles. Now, we won't see all of that today, but we're going to see that as we go through the first two chapters, that not only did he receive it from the risen, glorified head of the church, but the other apostles gave him the right hand of fellowship. They recognized as well that he had this divine authority, this apostleship. So let's begin in verse 1. Of course, it begins just simply with his name, Paul, a name that they would be familiar with, uh, because as we look at the churches of Galatia in chapter 2, we're going to find out that they hold their existence to this very man. He was the one who preached the gospel to them. Okay, so Paul, and then it says an apostle. Now, notice how quickly he jumps in to, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And you get this idea that he's defending his apostleship very quickly. And so he, he says his apostleship is not from men as to its source, nor by men as to its agency. He was not appointed by a body of men, nor did he, a, a particular man commission him as, the, as their representative his apostleship came directly from divine persons. Notice this, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So no human laid hands on him, but he did have the ordination, if you like, of the nail-pierced hands of the risen, glorified Christ. Uh, that's where his apostleship came from. That's where his authority came from. And notice he says Jesus Christ and God the Father. And again, these are co-equal, co-eternal. It's from divine persons that he receives his apostleship. And again, the idea of an apostle, just in case we don't know what that means, it's one sent with a commission, one sent with a with a message. Uh, it, it's somebody who sent a sent one, basically. And of course, he's been sent by the risen, glorified head of the church and by God the Father who raised him from the dead, and he's been sent for what purpose? To preach this gospel, this this message that is now coming under attack from the Galatians. If the 12 had... Um, being commissioned by the Lord Jesus on earth, 
the Apostle Paul could say, I've been commissioned by the Lord from heaven, <laughs> the risen, glorified Lord. To reject him as an apostle was to reject not only the Son, <laughs> but also the Father, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. You see, it was the risen one that 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 risen Christ that sent him, and it was serious to, to be found opposing the one who had been so honored by the Father by raising him from the dead. And that's what they were doing. It was dishonoring, actually, to God to reject his apostleship. So Paul declares right early on here that he is independent of the original 12 and everybody else. This apostleship came directly from heaven. The extremely serious false teaching being perpetrated among the assemblies in Galatia meant that Paul was obliged to bring the highest possible, possible authority to bear on the situation. The highest authority is that he is an apostle of the risen man, sent to the Gentiles with the gospel, connected with the church, which is his body. And again, it's interesting how you compare with the other apostles. I know the, the other apostles, they're, they're kind of interesting because they're almost, well, they're bridging two dispensations, aren't they? They're, they're, they're certainly connected with Israel because do you remember Matthew 19, 28, uh, why they needed a 12th apostle was that these apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So they had, a, as it were, an earthly commission. And their commission was actually to give the message of the Messiah primarily to the nation of Israel. Israel rejected that testimony. One day they're going to sit in judgment on the nation of Israel. But their apostleship primarily was connected with Israel, sent to the lost tribes of Israel. This one was commissioned by the risen man. And he, his ministry is connected with the heavenly people, the church, which is his body. <laughs> and it's important to see that distinction. So who are these churches that are addressed by Paul? Notice uh, verse 2 and 3. He says, um, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins by saying, by the way, I'm not alone in my stand for the gospel. I'm writing this to you. I'm, I'm emphasizing my great apostleship, but I want you to know there's a lot of brethren that stand with me in this. Now, he doesn't name them. I think that he just wants to get to the issue. He, he The issue is so important that he the, the normal things that he usually does in his epistles, he usually talks about people that accompany him. He'll talk about Timothy and those that are with him. He'll usually have greetings. He'll usually thank God for the Christians in that area. There's a lot of things that are in normal epistles and not in Galatians. He doesn't even mention who they are. He just says, I'm not on my own. There's a lot of brethren who stand with me in defense of the gospel of the grace of God. You don't need to know who they are, but I want you to know there's a lot of them. <laughs> All the brethren that are with me uh, in this matter. And then he says, the churches of Galatia. Now, this is really important. Just even the phrase, the churches of Galatia. Because, again, our dear exclusive brethren, who we love very much in the Lord, they would they would balk at this idea of churches of Galatia because they only see one church. And see, they only see the church, which is his body. They don't see the local aspect. <laughs> and so notice he, he doesn't say the church, which is in Galatia. He says the churches. In other words, each of these meetings are recognized to have autonomy and responsible to individually to Christ as head. There are churches in these various localities throughout the region called Galatia. Now, not, notice that again that what's missing, we've already hinted at this, but there's nothing added to commend them. 
in the other epistles he's you know he's thanking god for them you know i just was reading in, in colossians this morning that even though he'd never met them he he delighted uh, from what he had heard to see their order and their stat, steadfast faith in christ and so he, he's commending them uh, even the Corinthians, for all their problems, he commends them that they come behind in no gift, and uh, you know he he speaks speaks of them. But but here, nothing. He's just going to get right down to business. And again, because the church is under such severe threat that we don't have time for niceties, we have to get down to business. And so that's what he's doing. And so he he uh, the denial of the true gospel the setting aside of the authority of him as an apostle, the turning again to the weak and beggarly elements, all of these things weighed so heavily upon the apostle that he said, I have to get down to business and we've got to get right to the heart of the matter. Now, the big question that has, uh, you you read commentaries uh, on Galatians and you'll find that when we talk about the churches of Galatia, are we talking about the northern Galatians or the southern Galatians? Now, this may not mean anything to you uh, at all, and ultimately it's not that important. I think this letter was for all of the churches of Galatia, whether in the north or the south. But it does have a bearing on things, uh, and that's why it's been debated. So let's just talk a little bit about Galatia as an area. So during the 3rd century B.C., so 300 years before Christ, some Celtic peoples or Gauls, right? You think of the Gauls, you think of um, the, the French, right? Asterix the Gaul. Anybody remember reading his <laughs> cartoons in the past, right? So so the Gauls. Now, now, the Gauls, why some people think that it's northern Galatia is um, the, the Celtic people can be quite fiery. You know, and so, you know, you've got the idea of the fighting Irish, all this kind of stuff. You know, you get the idea of the fiery kind of character. And so some say, well, they, they must have been the northern Galatians because one minute they're ready to pluck their eyes out and give them to the apostle. And the next minute, <laughs> uh, they, they they don't even believe he's an apostle. So because of their, what, what some would say, their emotional instability, some say, oh, they must be the, the Gauls. They must be the northern Galatian area. So these Celtic people or, or Gauls migrated to this area, and after fighting with the peoples they encountered, they settled in the northern part of Asia Minor. In due course, they came into conflict with the Romans, who defeated them. And from this time, they remained under the authority of the Romans as a dependent kingdom. The name Galatia covered the territory settled by the Gauls. But there are essentially two regions of Galatia, one in the north, which is primarily where the Gauls were, which includes um, cities like Pessinus, Ancrea, Tavium, and then southern Galatia, which were less influenced by the Gauls, but still came under this Roman province of Galatia, and they included cities that we're much more familiar with. Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Okay. And this is um this debate is 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 this who he's writing to? Is it Southern Galatia primarily? And of course, uh, these are the churches that he established. We read them in Acts chapter 14, uh, 13 and 14, uh, where he goes to places like Lystra and Derby and, and uh, Pisidian Antioch and Iconium. And so let me just say where I stand. I believe it's Southern Galatia without any question. Uh, and uh, uh, But there's a lot of good men differ. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. The message is the same, and it's for the Galatians. But uh, why would I believe that it's the Southern Galatian area? Well, it, it seems to me that these churches in the southern part of the province, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, churches that were founded on Paul's first missionary journey, and he marvels, seems like he knows them pretty well, that they've so soon turned away to this other gospel 
he, he's just in shock that they, they've he, he's seen how they responded the first time when they, the gospel came to them, and he's seen how quickly. Also, it would give uh, verification for the early date because Paul didn't go to northern Galatia till the second missionary journey. And so that would, again, emphasize that it probably is southern Galatia who are primarily in view uh, in these letters, the churches of Galatia. And of course, he gives his normal greetings, but there's there's something a bit more going on here because he, his normal greeting is grace and peace. And of course, he does that to all the, the churches. But what they're bringing in is going against grace and is going to cause them to lose their peace. <laughs> See, when, when you begin to add law to the gospel, then you... you, you you're no longer on the grounds of grace. It's grace plus works. And if you add works to it, how can you know peace? <laughs> because uh, there's always this thought, well, have I done enough works? See, that's that was that was me in, as a Roman Catholic. Our, our means of justification, we were told, is justification is by faith in Christ plus good works. The difficulty was nobody could ever tell you how many good works you had to do in order to be justified. So as a result of that, you could never know settled peace. And even popes have died wondering had they done enough. Well, isn't it wonderful to actually say, actually, I know I could never do enough, but the Lord Jesus did enough. He said it's finished. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so the difference is, is we're standing in the grounds of a finished work. And so we understand grace. We marvel in grace. And we have peace because we know God has accepted the work of his son. And as a result of that, we have a settled peace concerning our eternity. Paul used the word grace more than 100 times in his writings. When you add all the other writers of the New Testament together, they only use it 55 times. He uses it 100 times. He is essentially the apostle of grace. Uh, the Lord Jesus, when he came, it says, law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Of course, the Lord Jesus is the one who brought grace into this world to man. You know, in a not that there wasn't grace under the law, but in all its fullness, it came by Jesus Christ. Here now we find the one who has given the the marvelous task of becoming the messenger of grace, and it's good to be a grace man, isn't it? To be a messenger of grace, and so uh, he truly was the apostle of grace. Grace is both the source of divine blessing and peace. Uh, it's the source of blessing. Peace, if you like, is the result of it. Both rest on a historical event from whence grace flows and peace is enjoyed. And that historical event is the work of Christ on Calvary. Grace is what Christ brought. right? So uh, the grace of God which brings salvation has come to all men. Who brought it? The Lord Jesus brought it. He brought grace Peace is what he left behind. He says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. And so grace is what the Lord Jesus brought, Titus 2.11. Peace is what he left, John 14, verse 27. I want to think a little bit about the deliverance described by Paul now in verses 4 and 5. It says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Like so many epistles, the key to understanding the epistle hangs right at the door. Paul immediately emphasizes salvation through Christ and sanctification through Christ. So, salvation... He gave himself for our sins. It has sin's penalty in view. He came to pay that penalty. And so it says he gave himself for our sins. 
So that's the penalty of sin that's in view. And that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now we've moved from sin's penalty to sin's power. And he has come to deliver us from this present evil world, that sanctification. And so the Lord Jesus is the great savior and the great sanctifier. Uh, he has come to deliver us. And so neither salvation nor sanctification are accomplished by the works of the law, but by the person and work of the Lord Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Christ, our Savior, Christ, our Sanctifier. Not the law, our Savior, not the law, our Sanctifier, Christ. And so it's, it's, it gets it out right at the start. It's, it's, it's him. I love this uh, description, who gave himself. You see, Christ's work was voluntary. He, he gave himself. He, he, no coercion here. He gave himself. In all the greatness of his person, in all the dignity of his excellence, in all the majesty of his worth, in all the glory of his power, he gave himself. Absolutely voluntary. Let's just look back in John's Gospel, chapter 10, just to affirm this. John chapter 10, verse 18. We love these words. John 10, verse 18, it says this. No man taketh it from me, speaking of his life. Uh, let's just read from verse 17 to get the connection. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. You get the idea, the vo entire voluntary nature of the death of Christ. I lay it down of myself. And so here he is, giving himself. And again, Scripture just emphasizes this over and over again. I'm, I'm going to just uh, go through several verses that talk about him giving himself, because it's good for us to be reminded of the entirely voluntary nature of the work of Christ on Calvary and why he did it. What are some of the things in view? Here, he gave himself for our sins, on account of our sin, sins, uh, that, that he might bear our sins in his own body on that tree, uh, in our place, in our stead. But let's look at some of the other references. Look at Ephesians, the next epistle, Ephesians 5. A couple of scriptures in Ephesians 5 where this thought is brought up again about his voluntary sacrifice. It says, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. These sweet-smelling savor offerings in the book of Leviticus. I'm just reading Leviticus' early chapters right now in my devotions. But what marks out the early offerings, like the burnt offering, the peace offering, the meal offering, uh, the, the meal offering, peace offering, they were voluntary, no coercion. And they brought, they were sweet savor offerings. They brought a sweet savor to the presence of God. And isn't it wonderful that the Lord Jesus gave himself voluntary, this voluntary offering. He gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Chapter 5, verse 25 of Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Not just for us individually, not just for our sins individually. He gave himself for the church, uh, the whole church in view. He, he loved the church. He gave himself for her. How wonderful. But it's not just limited to the church. Look at First Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. Maybe we'll read from verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. His sacrifice had all men in view. Yes, it was for us individually. 
and for our sins. Yes, it was for the church, but his death, we often say it was sufficient for all men. Uh, his his death, uh, First Epistle of John, uh, this his death is a propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Uh, we've often said this, and we say it again unashamedly. The only thing that limits the atonement is human unbelief. The only thing that limits the atonement is human unbelief, and uh, uh, his ransom was enough, sufficient. There was enough merits in the work of Christ that if every human being that had ever lived had put in a claim, there would have been enough merits in his work for all mankind. Such is the magnitude of the work that he did on Calvary. And I hope it thrills your souls to think of the magnitude of the work of Christ. Don't limit it in any way. Titus uh, chapter 2 and verse 14. Titus 2 verse 14 it says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. So again, there's a purpose in view. He, th there should be a, an effective response to him giving himself for us. And that is, uh, he, he came to set us free from a life of bondage and iniquity and, and that we might live a life of holiness and good works. That is the result of his work. Not adding to his work, it's the result of his work. This is what it should produce in us. And then back in Galatians chapter 2, one more reference in verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God. And Don't you just love this? This is so personal. Paul says this. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. Brethren, isn't that a thrill to your souls this morning, to think that he loved you as an individual? Yeah, he loved the world, and he loved the church, and but he loved you, and he gave himself for you. I mean, it didn't get any more personal than that. And, and so... Uh, these, these are wonderful, wonderful truths. I am the good shepherd, John 10, verse 11. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And so he gave himself for us. And what was the purpose? Well, first of all, for our sins. He offered himself, we've already said, a vicarious and sac in a vicarious and sacrificial sense, bearing the judgment due to us, he stood there as our substitute. If this, this is the case, and it is, there's no need for it to be supplemented by law-keeping of any kind. He died for our sins. God is satisfied. It's erroneous to try to add anything to it. He died on account of our sins. The penalty of our sin in view here, he came for that purpose, gave himself for our sins. And then he says, second part, and this is the sanctification part, that he might deliver us from this present evil world or evil age, as some translations put it. And so it really does indicate this evil system controlled by the evil one, Satan, with its many corrupting principles and practices. God has rescued us from out of it, that we might be free to serve him. And the idea of deliver is not deliverance from the presence of something here, but deliverance from the power of something. See, we're still living in this present evil world, but we're not of it anymore. <laughs> That's not our home anymore. We're citizens of a different kingdom, right? We have a different home. And so, uh, we're delivered from this present. Now, our final deliverance from this present evil age will be at the rapture. We'll be taken out of it altogether. But right now, we're experiencing deliverance from the power of this present evil world right now because of the work of Christ. So the power of sin is in view here. And of course, the predetermining of his death it's all according to the divine will here, because he says, uh, he, this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. This was the will of God. 
And uh, Christ did not die in order that God might love men or that it might become his will to save men. Christ died because God did love men and because it was his will to save men. <laughs> and so this is the divine will. This is the counsels of eternity. God knew that men would sin, and God already had a plan in view. And that plan was, of course, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. And it was all part of his perfect will, that his son would come, according to the will of God and our Father, to give himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. And... The result of his death is seen in verse 5. To whom glory, whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul is almost like he can't contain himself. Even though it's a very stern task of confronting false teaching, as he begins to bring out the fullness of the person and work of Christ, he just bursts into praise, lost in wonder, magnifying the God who has done so great a work. Christ's work at Calvary supremely brought glory to God. What, what a superlative note, as it were, to end this prologue, this introduction uh, to this epistle by this outburst of praise. To God be the glory forever and ever. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, you see, false teaching about the gospel robs God of his glory. That's why it's so serious. It robs God of the glory that he alone is worthy of. If you add something to the gospel by saying, well, you have to do something, I'm taken away from God's glory. This is a work that he has done through the person of his son, and he alone is to get the glory. But if I do something to contribute, I might think, well, you see, you know, God did so much, but I had to, I had to finish it off. So I had to do these works. I had to do this law keeping. And so it, it, men can glory in their flesh. But the whole point of this gospel is that the only one who gets the glory is the one who alone is worthy of it. People would ask us, if God was to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would we say? If you have a gospel of works, you'd say, well, it's because I've been such a good person and I've done so many good things. And so it would immediately be robbing God of glory. But if we were to be asked, to ask me, why should God let me into his heaven? I would say this, I don't deserve to be there for one iota. I don't, but I'm going to be there because of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus on Calvary. It's only because of him, because he died on account of my sin <laughs> to deliver me from this present evil world. To him be the glory alone. And so what a gospel it is. Let's preach it, brethren. Let's, let's get it out. There's no message like this message. It's marvelous. It's good news. And it's, it's a message that glorifies the Savior through and through because of what he has done on our behalf. May God encourage us as we contemplate this introduction to the book of Galatians. Amen.